Hallelujah. I'm about to test these mics, see which one's better. Almost threw my voice out Sunday. Hallelujah. 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 All right, hold on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is better. All right, we're going with this then. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Amen. See what it is, if I don't hear myself, it's just a natural reaction to begin to go louder. And you don't even realize that you throw your voice out. So we got to work on that. Hey Amen. Well, let's get out those Bibles and go to the book of Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to take a look at verses 8. I think I told you guys 8 to 9, but let's read 8 through 10. Amen. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Wait a minute. Matter of fact, let's jump up to verse 7. Can y'all do that? I didn't even see that. It kind of goes with the message. I mean, all of it. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please it, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Amen. I want to minister tonight on the faith perspective, the faith perspective. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, I just thank you for the awesome opportunity to minister your word. And Lord, I ask right now that you will give me the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, the words of understanding. Father God, that you would give me utterance to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would have me to speak. Father God, I pray tonight that your people hear your voice in my voice. Father God, use the word tonight to speak into people's lives, speak into their situations, speak into their circumstances, Father God. Lord, let it not just be information, but let it be an impartation of your spirit, Father God, to bring the grace of God so we will not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So, Father God, let the body of Christ here at the lighthouse be edified, built up, strengthened, refreshed, revived in the inner man like never before. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in advance in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, say amen. You know, as a Christian, we have an amazing advantage in this life. The living God allows us to have his perspective while living here on planet Earth. Even though the Bible said that my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. As a Christian, God makes that knowledge available to us. One of the things that um, and when you become a Christian, the thing that begins to change is your perspective. And your perspective is how you view the world around you. How do you view yourself? How do you view God? And then you, how you view things will affect how you react to things. Sometimes our biggest problem is not the problem. It's how we're looking at the problem. When we look at problems wrongly, we react in the wrong way. And we're going to go through the word of God tonight and see that God really Really, it's not the determining factor is not what happens to you. The determining factor is how you react to what happens to you. The Bible says in this world, you will have tribulation. Be, be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have already overcome the world. So he's telling you you're in the world and you're going to go through stuff. But at the same time, I've already overcome the world. So Jesus come to change our perspective, how we look at the things that we go through in life. 
say perspective. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 said, we walk by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? We walk by the outcome, not by the things that are in between. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I don't walk by what is seen. I walk by the outcome that God has already revealed to me. We don't walk by situation. We walk by revelation. And revelation will always trump situation because situations are subject to change. So you never have to be moved by what you see in the natural because just like a, a picture, God can change the picture and put a brand new picture in. It may be cloudy today, but tomorrow, the sun can come back out weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning and we know that because of the God we serve he can change situations on our behalf so we never have to react in the in between because we already know what the outcome is now a lot of us you need to God is saying come on you got to give me more credit because I've been bringing you through stuff year after year, month after month, and you're still here. So what do you think, why, why would I change and why would you go into depression and oppression through things that you go through and all you have to do is look back one year over your life and see that I was a good God, that I was a faithful God, that I was an awesome God and I brought you through. And God is saying in 2020, you got to change your perspective. You can't look at giants and be overwhelmed. You got to look at the God that you serve that is above the giants and get heaven's perspective and realize you're you're above a lot of stuff that you think is on top of you. Once you've been walking with the Lord, you start realizing, I just keep coming out of stuff. There was a storm, but I came out of it. The storm did not destroy me. The storm did not knock me down. The storm did not make me lose my mind. I'm here. And, 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 and listen, even though I had to go through some birthing pains, listen, the joy of what I had to birth eventually came out, and bam, there it is. <laughs> Amen. Our sister, everybody know what this woman is, was believing for, believing for her son to be delivered and set free. By the power of God, when man said no, God said yes. When the devil tried to shut the door, God opened up the door. He said, I will open up doors that no man can shut. Listen, probation people, uh, government people, people with power and authority. But when God says it's time to come out, you're coming out. It does not matter who's trying to hold the door closed. God will kick the door down to get his people out. And now she's here many times coming up to this altar, praying for you, young man, believing that you were coming out. Say, God, just bring my son to Florida. Bring my son to Florida. Protected him in jail. Then the doors are open for the jail. Then the devil tried to keep him in the jail. And, and finally, God delivered him and set him free. God preserved him while he was waiting. The devil could not take his life before the time because God had a plan. God heard a mother's prayer in Riverview, Florida and moved in Georgia to deliver and set her son free by the power of God. God is a... God said, change your perspective. You can be right here in Florida minding your business, praying I'll move in a whole nother state. You don't got to go to the state. I'll move. You stay. You don't got to move. I'll move on your behalf. God said, just bring it to my throne of grace. Just lift it up to me and watch me do miracle signs and wonders on your behalf. And I was glad she kept coming to church. You know, a lot of people would be like, uh, after the, the first no or the second no, this Christianity stuff don't work. God ain't heard me. They throw in the towel, and we don't see him again because God did not answer them when, he, when they thought he should answer them. And she would have missed the, before the package arrived. She would have missed her day of salvation. She would have missed her season of blessing. She would have missed the breakthrough that she was crying for, believing for, because sometimes we give up before the miracle shows up. God heard you, and God is going to answer you in his time, in his season. There's some stuff that God's got to move on your behalf that you're completely unaware of. 
Just trust him. Trust him. God said, you got to trust me for we walk by faith and not by sight. You're going to walk by, by, you're going to be walking, not seeing what you're believing for. But you can't walk by what you don't see. You got to walk by, by, by what the word promised you. You got to believe in an, an invisible God to bring something visible into your life. So we walk by faith. We, we don't walk by sight. We don't get stuck in between. We walk it out to the outcome. Somebody say the outcome. Gentlemen, can you pull up 2 Corinthians 4.18? Because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. So the Bible says don't even focus your attention on what is seen, but what is unseen. That's why a lot of y'all need to go write the vision down. And when you don't see it in the natural, you got a piece of paper that you wrote it down on and you refer back to that. I don't see it out here, but I wrote the vision down. This is what is in my heart and this is what God is eventually going to bring to pass. And I'm not going to be moved by this. I'm only going to be moved by this, what I've written down by Almighty God. And, and um, I don't know when it's going to happen, but eventually God is going to make good on his prop- promise. Look at your name and say, write it down. Write it down. Somebody say, be specific. Yeah, have back a two and two. Write the vision down. Make it plain. Perspective, a mental view or, or a, a mental view or prospect, a visible scene. It's amazing how two people can look at the same thing and see something completely different. The difference is not the thing. The difference is perspective. Let me say it again. The difference is not the thing. The difference is your perspective. Your perspective is determining your direction. The Lord wants your life going in the right direction. The direction should always be for. Now, let me say this. There is nothing that comes into your life that can end your life. There is nothing that hell can send into your life that can end your story. There is nothing that can show up on the radar in your life that's going to block you from receiving what the Lord has for your life. There's no letter in the mail. There's no, there's no bad report. There's no ruling from a judge. There, 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 there's nothing that the DMV has said. There's nothing that the court system said that can stop what God has promised for your life. So what is the problem then? The devil is banking on you having the wrong perspective and giving up before the miracle shows up and running, thrown in the towel before the manifestation. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So your faith Listen, is is victory overcoming faith. So there's nothing that is in your life or could come into your life that your faith that you have on the inside cannot overcome. Look at your name and say, I am an overcomer. It came in my life, but I'm going over it. And we're going to get past it. But we're going to have it, we're going to look at it with the right perspective because the Lord wants our direction in life to always go forward not backwards now listen your perspective is your reality have you ever heard someone make this statement I don't see it like that you telling them something and then all of a sudden they come back I don't see it like that what they're saying is they have a different perspective Now you can understand why our world is in chaos. It's a bunch of different perspectives colliding with one another. I was watching this this thing on TV. I was going to call it a thing. And I'm listening to this lady. And I'm like, are they hearing what I'm hearing? That lady's lying. 
But what I realize is if you have not been conditioned by truth, you won't be able to recognize truth. So I'm like, what, as a Christian, people fall for stuff that are not Christians. So but, but we, when your ear has been conditioned and you have the spirit of truth residing on the inside of you and everything that comes in your ear gate has to be filtered through the Holy Spirit and it's got to bear witness with the spirit or the spirit will rise up and say, uh-uh, you don't need a liar, lie detector test. She's lying. My kids try it all the time. Just tried it last night. I'm like, you think I believe that? I said, no. So now we understand why the world is in chaos. Because people don't have truth to base their perspective on. That's why we need truth. Because to filter your perspective through. Look at the military. People with different perspectives that come from all around the world and join the organization. And why does it work? Because they leave their perspective, their way of doing things for the way the military does things. And they have a code and they agree on it and they live by it. So they have a code that they live by even though all ages, all uh, uh, walks of life come together to join the armed forces. They all are able to walk in unity because they come up under the umbrella, under the standard of the U.S. military. And so it should be with us. Our perspective got to come under the perspective of the word of God. Now listen, last week I did a few offering teachings about not only giving but receiving. Now, yes, and I used to be somebody who believed, just give, don't expect nothing back. Then God had to show me in his word, that's unscriptural. Look at every scripture I ask you to give, and you will see that there's an action by you and then an action by me. For you to stop and try to and, and have this false humility, like I don't want none, is actually pride. You know what? I don't really feel like that. I feel like um, I shouldn't even be doing that. But, Lord, because you said it, I'm going to agree with it and let go of my perspective and take on your perspective. And now I can receive accurately from the kingdom of God because I was willing to leave my perspective to take on God's perspective. He said, Tone, tell them to give and receive and then give them scriptural Proof that it's truth. And then it's up to you to abandon your perspective for God's perspective. Gentlemen, pull up Matthew 6.33. Listen to this. But first and most importantly, seek, aim, and strive after his kingdom and his righteousness. Listen to this. His way of doing and being right. Look at your name and say, his way. Not your way. God's way. That's where we begin to, to mess things up because we're not willing to let go of our way for God's way. But listen, if you're going to receive from God, you got to begin to do things his way, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of a God, and all these things will be given to you. A lot of times we're not receiving because we're refusing to do it God's way. But the minute you make a decision to leave your perspective, take on God's perspective, get ready because the increase is about to come into your life. But you got to get rid of this religious and this worldly thinking and these religious things that were passed down to us and these things that make us uh, uh, feel good, but they have no scriptural basis. Look at your name and say, you, you need to read that Bible. <laughs> you need to get out your head. And put your head in the Bible. You need to get out your reasonings. Say reasonings. Oh, my God. I love the scripture in 2 Corinthians. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. 
But then it talks about human reasonings that combat against the word of God, a human argument. I was sharing with our brother uh, uh, Wally that I said, when you minister in church in the spirit, you, you're open to everything in the spirit in the room. So I told him I can sense if somebody was over here resisting me. I don't even have to look at it. I can sense it. So you begin to pick up things in the spirit. You can almost see that, oh, there's a pocket of doubt and unbelief over there. Them people ain't paying attention. And you start picking up things in the spirit. What, and it's just God. You're, you're in a room, and you're picking up all this spiritual activity. But it, a lot of times the Lord showed me, said, Tone, what they're combating with, you're saying truth, but it's battling with their human reasoning. These thoughts, these strongholds that are not based on my word. And when truth comes, it comes to tear down human reasonings. Somebody say stinking thinking. The devil is not your enemy. It's your stinking thinking. Get the thinking in line with the word of God. So seek first God's way of doing things, and these things will be added to you. It's so important when you become a Christian to renew your mind to the word of God. The word of God will give you the most accurate perspective to live by. Gentlemen, Romans 12, 2 in the Passion. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life satisfying and perfect in his eyes. I'm going to give you all a golden nugget right now. Some God showed me as a baby Christian. And I'm like, God, I heard you over here. I heard you. Why are you not speaking to me? And he said, pick up my Bible. I remember picking up the word. And he said, when you begin to walk out what is already known to you, and what I've already taught you, and you start walking my known will, I'll start speaking to you about the unknown will. But you, I'm not going to give you, uh, <laughs> we're not graduating to that until you can obedi be obedient with the textbook. We're not going to talk about wives and ministry and all this other stuff, and you don't even know how to hold your tongue. You don't even know how to forgive. You keep still getting offended when I told you how to deal with stuff. You want me to speak to you about stuff I've already spoken about. And he said, Tone, when you, he said, you want, it, you want the, the, the heavens to open up, you begin to hear my voice with clarity, begin to be somebody. Now, I'm not saying you, 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 you hit it all the time. Nobody's perfect. We miss it. But when you have a heart and a mind and a spirit that desires to do the right thing and God sees you trying to do the right thing, he'll begin to speak to you. But God is saying, don't ask me to say something. You're not even being obedient to what is written down. Now you want me to talk to you? Let's put that scripture back up. Your faith perspective. Okay. <laughs> Stop imitating the ideals and opinion of the culture around you. Somebody say around you. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life satisfying and perfect in his eyes. You know, I love our ministry. Because we deal with this, the renewing of the mind. That it's not just about getting saved, 
It's about renewing your mind to, per, to, per, to the perspective of God. And what happens is you and for, for people that are in church or the faith home, you're in a protected environment. And in that, God is trying to change your perspective so you don't go out of here and make a mess. And I see a lot of people leave before they're ready, before the time. And because certain perspective, you're good in this area, but you didn't allow God to work in this area. So you're having success over here, but battles over here. And it usually can be traced back that you didn't let God work in that area of your life for your perspective to be changed. A total, listen this, a total reformation. It means an improvement, an amendment of what is wrong to fix it, to put it in line. To change to a better state to improve by alteration. Scriptures are given to change our perspective, not to put on a bumper sticker, not to put on Facebook. They're meant to change our perspective. I mean, put it on Facebook. I'm not saying that. Put it on, man, because somebody needs to see it. But ultimately, first, it should be used on us. Don't put something on Facebook that ain't you ain't used on your own life. And I ain't on Facebook, so nobody don't think I'm shooting darts at you or something. I'm not even on it. I'm off of that now. Okay. So in Hebrews 4.12, they don't have this, but just listen. For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, and it pierces more sharply than a two-edged sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being where soul, spirit, bone, and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our heart. Look at your neighbor and say, the word of God is like a scalpel in the hand of of a surgeon. So when the word of God comes or you see something in the word of God, that word of God cuts through all the facades and goes and begins to deal with the motives and an intent of your heart. Now listen, what is it about? Now a surgeon goes in to do surgery to remove something that should not be in the body. It's preventing the body from functioning at the capacity that it's supposed to be functioning. And God sends his word into your life to remove thinking, thinking out of your life so you can begin to function at the capacity that the word of God promises you. But a lot of us want to jump off the surgery table before the surgery is done. And then you bleed out. <laughs> and we got to bring you back anyway, sew you up, wait till you men and pick up where we left off. Tense of care. I see you. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Come on, y'all stop. Let's get back to the word. Gentlemen, next scripture. Listen to this. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And, when, and then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. What a scripture. In the scripture, the word is telling us to change your perspective when you go through the trials of life, trials, I should be crying. No, when you're going through trials, the Bible says to do just the opposite. It says see it as an opportunity to test your faith out, so get happy about it. You know, I realize now anything that comes into my life have, had to pass the love of God. And I know he didn't, it didn't allow it to come in my life to wipe me out. But it's, a, it's something to work my face. So I say now, when something comes in my life, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to use my faith in an area I've not used it. Because the last thing you want is not to grow as a Christian. Somebody say, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. 
A lot of us have been stuck on second floor, and God is trying to get you on the 10th floor, but you've been uh, reacting the wrong way, and we can't advance you to the level that you need to be. But it says, count it all joy when you face difficulties and an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. An opportunity to test your faith, to see it as an opportunity to grow spiritually. Now listen to this. Spiritual growth should be your, one of your highest priorities. This is why. Listen to this. Let me say it again. Spiritual growth should be one of your highest priorities, and this is why. Because your level of blessing is connected to your maturity level. God will not give you certain levels of blessing until you arrive at certain levels of maturity. And sometimes it's, our, it's not God holding it back. It's us playing kitty land, nursery, toddler, daycare stuff, and we can't get the level of blessing that God's called. God, give me a wife. But you can't get along with the guy next to you. God, I want this job. I want this big job, but you can't be faithful with a little job. And God is not going to promote you beyond your level of maturity. Gentlemen, pull up that next scripture in Jeremiah. Listen to this. Jeremiah 12, 5, the Bible says, The Lord rebukes Jeremiah for his impatience, saying, If you have raced with men on foot and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, where you feel secure, then how will you do among the lions in the flooded thicket beside the Jordan? Interesting. I like that. I said the Lord rebukes Jeremiah for his impatience, saying you have raced with men on foot and they have tired you out. How in the world can you compete with horses? And if you fall down in a land of peace, Will you feel secure? Then how will you, how, what will you do among lions? Or what it means is, how will you do in the jungle? A lot of us, God is, brings us into a, a, a peaceful place, and we can't even serve the Lord in that. And he's saying, how are you going to run within the jungle if you can't even run by the still waters? Look at your neighbor and say, sometimes we fool ourselves. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I got this. I got this. But you're bumping your head right where you're at. And God is saying, listen, I'm not saying this to be hard on you. I'm saying this to get on with the program. To say, you know what? I need to grow up. You know what? I got to stop playing games. You know what? I got I to change my perspective. And watch things begin to move. Watch you begin to run with the horses and the big things. Your current level in life is qualifying you for the next level. If there is a struggle, it signifies that we have more growing to do, and that's okay. You just got to get with the program. Don't get out of the, we ministered not that long ago, don't get out of the process of your spiritual development. Keep on developing i'll be honest with you guys i don't pass every test the lord throws my way but uh, i know it's coming back around though but i got a heart that wants to do the right thing god i want to do the right thing i don't want to keep on repeating the same test the message for 2020 is uh grow up so we can go up and i'll, I'll just give you all a, a little piece but the lord showed me um, it's, 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 it's an individual word, but it's also a corporate word. He said that I cannot, even though I want to, I cannot go to higher levels on immaturity. And it's not, it's, it, it can't be one or two. It has to be a corporate maturity in the church. Listen, you go to ministries that are soaring. They don't deal with some of the stuff we be dealing with. Because it's not kitty land. It's people that are mature that have what? That are kingdom-minded, not self-minded. 
See, when you're kingdom minded, you, I'm not going to uh, blow up the whole thing because I got my feelings hurt. No, this is bigger than my feelings. This is bigger than my house. This is about the kingdom of God. This is about eternity. This is about souls. These are about people's life. And some of us need to expand our thinking and get out of this selfish mode just with what, what, what I want. But he said it hinders it for churches and individual lives. And in 2020, God said we're going to grow up so we can go up. It's going to just go up automatically. Soon as you just say, you know, I'm letting that go. That's stupid. I, I used to go around this mountain for a, for a week. I used to let her get to me. And you know what? No more. No more. I'm done with that. And I'm going to grow up so I can receive what God has for my life. Look at your neighbor and say, let it go. Now watch you begin to grow. And then watch you begin to go up. Next scripture, gentlemen. Listen to this. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, but we know that they are good for us. What? They help us learn to be patient. And patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. See, a lot of times we up and down. Boop, 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 boop. And God sees that. He's not mad at you. He loves you. But he knows, you know what? We got to level that off. We got to level that off. I got to get you off that roller coaster. I can't bring you into life on a roller coaster. I got to level you off. Because if I put you on that job, I put you in that relationship, and you're like this, it ain't going to last. So we're going to level you off. And sometimes the things you're going through are designed, and you feel like you're going like this, and God is leveling you off. You might come out, and then you go right back in it again, and what is God doing? Say, oh, that's a little better. I see some improvement. All right, give her a rest. Now go through again, and we're going to level it off. We're going to make you steady. We're going to make you consistent. We're going to take this up and down hysteria out of your spiritual walk. We're going to get you off this emotional, psychological roller coaster. We're going to get you to live and walk in the spirit of God, to walk by faith and not by sight, to walk by heaven's perspective. We're going to shake the unsteadiness out of your spirit so you can be consistent. And sometimes you're wondering where God is at. <laughs> He's behind it. <laughs> He's behind it. It said it's good for us. It's good for us. What? It's good for us. Getting shaken? Listen to this. In the natural, it's the things that don't taste good that are the best for us. How many people like ice cream and cake? Fried chicken. Come on now. Woo. Oh, man. Tone, don't throw out food to the last five minutes because people start losing people. They're like, All right, what we, what we eating when we get out of here? Wrap this thing up, man. Yeah. But what is it? The things that are not, don't taste good are actually the best things for us. And the things that taste good are usually bad for us. How many people know that flowers probably grow more in a valley than on a mountaintop? Because on a mountaintop, there's, you're exposed to the sun. There's no dirt up there, and they probably end up burning up. But in a valley, things begin to grow. And sometimes we go through valleys, and God is saying, change the way you're looking at it and realize that I don't allow anything to come into your life unless it's for your benefit. Listen to this. I remember in, uh, when I left the lighthouse and I fell. And I remember I came back. Do you know that for the uh, first three, four years after that, all of my ministry came out of that season? That I ministered to people how not to make the mistake that I did. So God used something that I thought was bad and used it as good as a learning lesson for me, but then prevented many others from making the same mistake. Exercise doesn't feel good. 
but it's good for us. No pain, no gain. Man, Pastor Tony, I like sitting on the couch. Yo, like them pounds like sitting there with you too. Like they be jumping on there with you too. How did that happen? They jumped on the couch with you. Why are you sitting there eating that ice cream? Holy mo. But listen, it works in the, in, the, in, the, in the positive too. You go to the gym, you start working out, you be consistent, then all of a sudden, somebody, usually somebody hasn't seen you in a while. Man, you done trimmed up. Or, man, you put on some weight. <laughs> you choose the reaction. The couch or the gym? Gentlemen, Joel 310. Listen to this. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. Wow. Listen to this. I was listening, looking at that scripture. Beat your plowshare. That's a farming thing. But look what it says. Beat it into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say I'm strong. What was God saying to Israel? He was saying change your perspective. Don't see yourself as a farmer. See yourself as a warrior. Put down that, that thing and beat that thing and, and turn. How many people know if you got a shovel, you, you, can, you can make it like a sword. <laughs> it's just how you use it. Somebody about to attack you, it go from a farming thing to a weapon. <laughs> I'll use this on you. But he was trying to get them to change their perspective. Don't see yourself as a farmer. See yourself as a warrior because there's a battle on the horizon. Don't say I'm weak. Say I'm strong. God was trying to get them to change their perspective. God is always trying to get people to change their perspective because perspective can either be a barrier that keeps you back or it can be a bridge that gets you over. When God found Gideon hiding out and afraid, what did he call him? He said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Des despite him acting like Somebody afraid, God called him a mighty man of valor. I come to tell you tonight, you're a mighty man and woman of valor. You don't have to shrink. You don't have to hide. You can come out and give God the victory before the victory even shows up. You're a mighty woman of God, a mighty woman, man of valor. Even when you're shaking, even when you felt like quitting, Pastor Tone, just a few hours ago, I'm about to give up. I don't care. You're a mighty man and woman of valor. You're still here, ain't you? Then there's something on the inside of you that's greater than what was trying to take you out. You're, and that's what I'm speaking to tonight. Change your perspective. You're a mighty man and woman of valor. Don't say I'm weak. Say I'm strong. But, Pastor Tony, I do feel weak. How, well, we're trying to change how you feel. And some of the hardest thing is trying to speak against your feelings. I'm Don't say I'm tired. I'm full of energy. I'm full of strength. I'm full of the power of God. My job's not going to wear me out. Kids ain't going to wear me out. This ain't going to wear me out. I'm full of strength. I'm full of energy. I'm full of the power of God and awaking the God that's on the inside of you. Listen, you don't have to do it in front of everybody. You can do it in your car. I do it in my car all the time. I'm full of the living God. I'm full of wisdom. I'm full of strength. I'm full of anointing. I'm full of the glory of God. I'm full of wisdom. And begin to call those things that are there so you can walk in that perspective. Yes, joy. Yes, that's right. You got to call out that joy. But I'm sad. I'm oppressed. You know what? I'm just going to start. Joy, joy. I'm full of joy, unspeakable, 
and full of glory. God gives me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I don't feel like praising the Lord, but I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to open my mouth. I feel like an elephant is on me, but I, I'm going to say it anyways. God, I praise you. God, I bless you, God. I love you. And all of a sudden, you start feeling yourself getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and break that oppression off your life. Go, oppression. And we're changing our perspective. We're moving in the power of God. And what, what is God doing? He said, my people, I'm trying to stop you from living life from the outside in. I want you to begin to live life from the inside out. And go on the inside of your spirit. Somebody say, pray in tongues. That's something we need to do more, people. We need to pray in the Holy Ghost. When you run out of prayers in your mind, go into the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that he that speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak unto men, but he speaks unto God. So he speaks mysteries. He speaks the perfect will of God. He speaks things that are beyond your knowledge. It's going into your future. It's arranging things. It's interceding for things you don't even know is going on, stuff that's trying to come into your life. You're actually praying against it. When you begin to pray in tongue, and the Bible says that he that prays in the unknown tongue edifies himself, builds himself up, builds himself up into an edifice. And when you're down, begin to exercise these spiritual gifts and begin to rise up from the ashes. I know we don't feel like it's the last thing, especially, especially in the mornings now. It's all chilly and stuff. Get out the bed, amen. I'm telling you, all of a sudden you'll, you'll feel that flesh shake off. You'll feel the spirit kick in and bam, you're on your way. And you begin to get spiritual momentum. Then all of a sudden you begin to train your flesh and all of a sudden your flesh wants to get up. Your mind might not want to get in your flesh. You enjoyed it so much. Like, let's get up and do that again. Gentlemen, let's pull up 1 Samuel 17.10. One more point. 1 Samuel 17.10. Listen to this. And the Philistine said, talking about Goliath. Somebody say Goliath. Listen to what this guy said. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. And greatly afraid. An army that is backed by Almighty God neutralized by the sight and words of a giant named Goliath. Israel in that moment needed someone with a different perspective. This battle had nothing to do with the size of a man. It had nothing to do with his weapons. It had nothing to do with human strength. It was a battle of perspective. Gentlemen, pull up the next scripture. Oh, that was on the end of that? Wait. Go to the 22. I must have wrote the wrong thing. Okay, as he talked with them, behold, there came out a champion the Philistine of Gath by name out of the armies of the Philistine and spoke oh, okay, according to the same words. And David heard them. So what it was, the, the giant was repeating the same thing that he repeated to Saul and his men, and he repeated it again. He spoke the same words. Let me ask you something. What is the same tactic that the enemy is using on you. And you keep reacting the same way. And that's why he keeps using the same thing. Because we keep reacting the same way. So Goliath said, I don't even have to do, come up with another confession. I'm going to use the same one that I neutralized Saul with. And I'm going to keep on saying it to keep Israel neutralized. But I like what it says. It said, then David 
heard it. He spoke the words. David heard the words. He heard the same things that the others heard. Now, pull up the next verse, gentlemen. And listen to David. Somebody say perspective. Listen to how this different perspective was to Saul and his men. And David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine? He, he's talking about killing him. But he want to know what's in it for me. I can do it. I'm the man for the job, but what's in it for me? And take away the reproach from Israel. Listen to this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So listen, David said, what will I get if I kill him? And then listen to what David said. This is David's perspective. David recognized that he was uncircumcised. What does that mean? That means David seen because he was a Philistine, he did not have a covenant with God. That man, listen, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. That's why the system couldn't hold this man back. Because she was crying out to a God that's bigger than the system. So he said, you're uncircumcised. That means God is not over there. God is actually over here. You're naked. You got all that stuff on, but in the eyes of God, you have nothing. You're naked and poor because you don't have a covenant with God. And then listen to it. He says, why? David said, why is this guy defying the armies of the living God? David had the right perspective and processed the situation correctly. You are uncircumcised. You have no covenant with God. That means you can't touch me. And he says the armies of the living God, he had the right perspective that God is alive and you're about to die. And because David had the right perspective, he reacted completely different and defeated Goliath before he showed. And before that, Israel was stuck. Your perspective will either have you stuck, gaining ground, or going around the same mountain. Now, we know the story for sake of time. I'm not going to go into it. But the Bible says when Goliath stood up and seen David, said, who is this little kid? The Bible says that David ran towards Goliath. You see, when you got the right perspective, you're not going to run from, you're going to run to the battle. None's going to make you shrink back. You're going to run because you know who's backing you up. I love living a life free of fear, free of fear of men, free of, fear, free of fear of, of situations and circumstances because I know who's on my side. I don't have to fear anymore. I was somebody that was bound by fear. That's why I used to do drugs to get bold. False boldness. But now I got boldness of the Holy Ghost. No fear. And people make the mistake like he sized up David, this young guy. But the young guy had a relationship with the Lord, and he feared nothing because he had the right perspective. Now I'm just going to leave you all with this. So ask yourself tonight, what is my perspective of God? What is my perspective of myself? What is my perspective of the world around me? Some examples, if you are walking in the wrong perspective, you will have a negative attitude. People with negative attitudes are walking in the wrong perspective. If you're walking around in offense, you're too touchy. You're taking stuff too personal. You're walking around in the wrong perspective. You're walking around in doubt not trusting God. You're walking around in the wrong perspective. You're a complainer, always complaining about everything, can't find anything good. Nothing is ever good enough for you. You have the wrong perspective. Fear, thinking the worst and expecting the worst, you have the wrong perspective. And tonight God is saying, my children, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. But I've made it all known by my word. And if you allow my word to change your perspective, there is nothing that comes into your life 
just like that Goliath that you will not overcome. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and give the Lord some praise. Glory. Perspective. Perspective. How do you view church? See it just as a place to come and somebody's preaching? No, it's a physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst, saith the Lord. He says where he sees unity, the body of Christ coming in together, he will command his blessing. That's why people that are connected to the church, they go through stuff, but they always seem to come out because of their connection to the body of Christ. Those that disconnect go through hell and stay in hell until they return back to the fold. Amen? Amen. Before we close tonight, we always want to ask the question, if you're here tonight and you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, raise your hand. We want to give you that opportunity if you're here tonight. Amen. Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, you know what, I need to rededicate my life back to the Lord. You know what, I, got, I let, I let a, a negative perspective come back in my life. I ain't been, I know better than this. If that's you, raise your hand. Anybody? Come on up, my sister. Come on up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tanya, you can pray with my sister. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Come on up, my sister. Come on up. The altar. What is the altar? Altar means to change. You get changed at the altar. God changes you, changes your mind, changes and then gives you impartation to protect the change. Anybody else? Come on up. Amen. Come on up, guys. Pastor Ralph, Pastor Diane, can y'all come on up? Help me pray. Amen. Come on up. Pastor Cecil, Pastor Mata, come on up, guys. Help me pray. Let me pray. Come on up, guys. Hallelujah. Come on up. Anybody saying, you know what? I need to change my perspective. Maybe you realize you've been resisting the hand of God. God is saying, don't resist it. Receive it. your body tonight. Anybody need healing in their body? Come on up. Dealing with a sickness, disease, cold. While I got any more prayer warriors in the house? Come on up. Yeah. Hallelujah. Antonia, come on up. Help me pray. pray for healing. We declare healing over this body. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 Healing the bomb of Gilead.
Halleluja. y'all can keep coming to the altar. We're going to do a dismissal and respect people's time. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless your people tonight. Father God, seal the word in their hearts, Father God. And Father, we just thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in our lives. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. Be blessed, people.